an eighth generation Floridian. That's a unique and special thing just in and of itself. And um, he has a very interesting educational background growing up in the 1950s and 60s, or uh, mostly 60s really, in Fort Lauderdale um, during the, in the segregated South. He went to an all black elementary school the, and a desegregated, um, a de desegregated middle and high school, and then the all white Pinecrest prep, which you may have heard of, it's a very well known uh, private school and was actually the first black student to attend and to graduate from Pine Press in 1974. Dr. Folks is a medical anthropologist as well as a sociocultural anthropologist. All of, these, yeah, all of it, yes. And with degrees from Berkeley, with degrees from Boston University School of Public Health, many publications, many awards, you know what? and what I think is so fantastic is a deep commitment to civic leadership in the Fort Lauderdale and greater South Florida area and a deep commitment to faith his family having worshipped at um, uh, the 110 year old Lauderdale Lakes First Baptist Church a, of Piney Grove which is very a uh, unique anything that is over 50 years old in South Florida you know is a very special thing so a commitment to um, a long commitment to um, what time do you have? To sit and grow like in South Florida. I think I may <laughs> have given <laughs> Professor Pope enough time to prepare. <laughs> You ready? I, I'm ready. Okay. And you're going to have to tell me how much time I am going to have because uh, well, I know it ends at 1.30, but I don't know if that's definite or not. So yes. just let me know. We have until 1.30. Sometimes some students, does anyone need to get to a 1.30 class? Okay, there are a couple people that might need to leave early to okay. get to a 1.30 class. Um, maybe we'll have a few minutes if folks don't have to, to kind Rush of out. run over. But okay. we'll, we'll keep it towards the 45, 50 minute mark. All right, thank you. Thank you. And thank I'm Stephanie, you. by the Stephanie. way. <laughs> okay, yeah, uh, <laughs> I work with Eric. <laughs> Eric gave me your information, so I'm, I'm okay. glad you got my message. Good afternoon, everyone. And again, please accept my apologies for uh, getting here at this moment uh, from Fort Lauderdale. I didn't realize once you get to West 836, um, it slows down, and then if there's an accident or two or three, it really slows you down. But I'm here, and I thank you for not giving me the 15-minute rule and leaving <laughs> before I got here. Uh, I've given you some handouts, and I'm just going to go over those very quickly. Uh, this is Black History Month, as you all know, uh, although I celebrate black history throughout the year. But this is from the uh, Florida Historical Society, um, and they've put out a nice document, I believe, on Florida Black Heritage Trail. And there are certain locations, even here in Miami, that you will find if you haven't visited them already. Also, I serve on the, uh, the advisory board for the race exhibit that is currently at the Miami Science Museum. And you all should have a copy of the description and uh, also a copy of a certificate that I prepared for those attending my workshop back in November at Nova Southeastern University. But this is a national um, exhibit produced by the American Anthropological Association uh, in, in 2007, and it has gone all over the country um, looking at the whole historical understanding of race and ultimately racism in this country. And I encourage you, if you have time, to go over to the Miami Science Museum, which is not far from the University of Miami, if I remember correctly. Um, and, and take a look at it. You have until the, uh, the 26th of, uh, of May. And I've included uh, some items regarding race, 10 things that everyone should know about race, and also three aspects of racism, institutionalized racism, personally mediated racism, and internalized racism. And I'll uh, leave that for you to look at and study on your own. Um, you also have a brief bio of me that was produced in 2009 by Pinecrest Preparatory School. Um, and on the back of that page, you will find the article that announced my graduation from Pinecrest in uh, 1974. Um, 
And so between 74 and, nine, and 2009, I have lived and worked in over 80 countries on five continents uh, as a medical anthropologist. But my experience as an anthropologist, my interest in anthropology, um, really began at Pinecrest. I, I call Pinecrest being the only black student out of 1,200 students and over 40 or 50 faculty and staff, that was my first anthropological village, so to speak. Um, and I began my research not really knowing what I was doing at that time, but later understanding. I began my interest in, in, in anthropology uh, at Pinecrest through that whole experience. Also, I'm a return Peace Corps volunteer. I served in Ghana, West Africa from 1982 to 84. And I'm always encouraging folk to think about placing a two-year stint in the Peace Corps anywhere in the world um, in your career development. So I've given you a current fact sheet on the Peace Corps, uh, the areas that they focus on, education, health, environment, community development, youth in development, agriculture, etc., and where volunteers are currently. Um, since the focus of my talk today is the unfinished black civil rights agenda, where do we go from here? I provided you with some background on uh, some of the common myths about slavery. And that's uh, on the, the third sheet from my bio. And I just will go through these very quickly before I show you a short video um, on the psychological residuals of slavery uh, as we experience them today both descendants of slaves and descendants of slave owners, and those of you who are immigrants who have come here and have found yourself placed in certain levels on the race ethnic hierarchy and are benefiting, or perhaps not for some, uh, because of that your place on that hierarchy. But some of the common myths about slavery. Uh, slavery was also a northern institution. We always think it was just in the south. Well, no, it was throughout the north and northeast. Uh, it was a national institution. It was practiced in all 13 colonies. It was enshrined in the Constitution. And it, permitted, it was permitted by the federal government uh, until 1808. Uh, slavery benefited the middle class families. Uh, slavery dominated the northern and southern economies during the colonial era and up to the Civil War. Uh, consumers bought and benefited from lower prices of goods uh, like coffee, sugar, tobacco, and cotton, all grown, raised, and collected by slaves. Uh, slavery benefited immigrant families. Immigrants who arrived after the Civil War still benefited from slavery and its aftermath. So you can read on through that. And on the other page, uh, the 10 biggest myths about black history. And we won't go through all of them, but I'll just list them for you and set the tone for our next part of the conversation. The Civil War was not fought over slavery. Well, it was. Uh, the civil rights movement was inherently communist. It was not. Uh, the modern Democratic Party is still the party of the Ku Klux Klan. As we look around, and if you're really vigilant, we will see that the Democratic Party is disproportionately African American. Uh, the parties over time switched places. I'm, in fact, a Republican. Um, everyone in my family is a Democrat. Um, everyone in my community is a Democrat. When I went to Washington, D.C. to work for then Senator Lawton Childs, who later became our governor, and also working in the office of the Department of Health and Human Services, Having to deal with the different parties, I became an independent because I was fed up with both of them. And I was independent until I returned to South Florida permanently in the year 2000. And at that time, I registered as a Republican. Uh, four, Martin Luther King Jr. was a Republican. Well, yes and no. But in fact, his father was. But again, although King's father was a lifelong Republican, which made sense, uh, since the Democrats supported segregation, this does not mean that his son was a Republican. Uh, Dr. King, according to PolitiFact, say that he was not, although the popular belief is that Dr. King was. And maybe in certain issues, he was in, in that camp. Um, five, there were other ways to end segregation besides civil rights movement. Well, if 
there were, it would have happened. So there was not. Uh, black American six are better off uh, because of slavery. And I think if you asked any African American, they would tell you that is not the case. Uh, if you look at the statistics about employment, about imprisonment, about a whole range of issues, HIV, all the diseases that you can think of, uh, African Americans, black Americans are not better off in this country because of slavery. Seven, slavery was not a dehumanizing institution. Some people believe that it, that, that was the case. Uh, but as the master's properties, blacks had no right no rule under the rule of law, and could be beaten, raped, sold, killed um, without recourse because they were not seen as human. Eight, the founding fathers worked to end or were opposed to slavery. Well, some um, of my fellow Republicans want to argue that that was the case, but the reality is most of our, the first eight, nine, ten presidents all owned slaves and were, were, were enriched by that process. Uh, nine, American innovation was exclusively white. Well, um, African Americans have made invaluable contributions to this country through inventions, explorations, and all fields of endeavor. Um, so you can look at uh, Randall Robinson's book, The Debt, What America Owes Blacks, and he talks about some of these issues. Lastly, blacks didn't fight in America's wars until World War II. Again, that's a lie. Black people fought in every American war, including the Revolutionary War, up until the current conflicts in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and, uh, God forbid, Iran and North Korea. But I do believe they're on the horizon, unfortunately. Um, if we move to the next page, I give you a definition of civil rights. And again, many groups are addressing and seeking civil rights as they traverse this country called the United States. My focus is on those who were brought here against their will through slavery and have since fought to gain the rights that everyone else in the society has. So the definition I, 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 I use here is uh, those rights guaranteed by the Bill of Rights, the 13th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution, including the right to due process, equal treatment under the law of all people regarding enjoyment of life, liberty, property, and protection. Positive civil rights includes the right to vote, the opportunity to enjoy the benefits of a democratic society, such as equal access to public schools, recreation, transportation, public facilities, housing, and equal and fair treatment by the law and the courts. So that's the definition that we'll be working with for the remainder of this, of this conversation. Now, on the left-hand side of that definition, you'll find two boxes. One, um, I've given my own time frame for when the black African civil rights movement really began. And I say it began when the first slaves were ripped out of the continent of Africa because you had slave revolts on, on the continent, on the ships, and once they were here, uh, up until the present. Also, I give you some definitions on internalized racism, personally mediated racism, institutional racism, and cultural racism. Again, we, talk, we hear the word racism, but there are different types of racism and reflecting different ways of, of interactions between whites and blacks and others in this society. Also, you'll find a, a chart with the historical forms of institutional racism, since that's what we, we're really dealing with today. Um, and it goes all the way back to 1492, yes, when Columbus came to these shores uh, through 1965 and then since 1975. So we still have the issue of institutional racism uh, plaguing this society and plaguing each of us. Uh, on the next page, you will find a nice uh, milestones in civil rights history. And again, you can look at that. Uh, but it begins uh, from Abraham Lincoln uh, and his Emancipation Proclamation all the way up to the present with the setting of the memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King in Washington, DC. Now, the subject of this talk, there was an article published in January 24th through 20th, 
2014, which says, civil rights leaders lament the unfinished business. And they talk about a lot of the accomplishments that we've made, the society has made, to grant civil rights, not just to people of African descent, but other groups, uh, but particularly African descent, uh, people of African descent, and what remains to be done. And I highlighted some of the key points there. A million people around the nation enjoyed the day of, uh, off on Monday. Many want volunteer in commemorating Martin Luther King's birthday holiday with educational events, etc. Without a doubt, there is substantial unfinished business ahead of us as a nation, particularly on the issues of voting rights and political empowerment, health inequities, employment, and asset building. There's a strong statistical evidence that politics is resegregating. And I would add, as the former chair of the Broward County Schools Diversity Committee, our educational system is re-segregating, uh, uh, with African Americans once again excluded from power and representation. Black voters and elected officials have less influence now than at any time in history, even with a mulatto, Obama, our president, in the White House. White mother, black father. Although he identifies himself as black, and the rest of us have all bought into that, that half-truth of who he is as a person. Uh, lastly, uh, what would King say? And, and, and Congresswoman Marsha Fudge says, uh, I believe Dr. King would applaud the progress that we've made toward racial and social equity, even with the advancement and the election of, and re-election of, of uh, Mr. Obama. But he would strongly caution us about the shrinking equality of opportunity currently plaguing our world. He would question our nation's persistently high unemployment rate, particularly for African Americans. He would ask Americans, uh, he would ask Congress, or he would ask why Congress couldn't agree on extending unemployment insurance to the long-term employed. Dr. King would ask why millions of Americans continue to live in poverty and seek work while corporations post billions in record profits. He would call for individuals to be paid wages that would prevent them from falling below the poverty line. And then the last highlighted words, uh, there is still much work to be done. And in light of that, and actually before that article, I've been thinking about this because there was a lot of talk about the 50th anniversary of the March on Washington, the 150th anniversary of uh, Abraham Lincoln's um, uh, Emancipation Proclamation, how much progress have we made, really, uh, to people who built this country, literally from the ground up. So. For the diversity summit at NOVA last fall, I did a workshop with this title. Uh, I had a little bit more time, but I identified what I thought were the 10 remaining unfinished civil rights agenda items, and that's the last page of that handout. There are more, believe me, but these are some that I, living in this country as a black American of African descent, feel that we still have much more work to, to do. One, the psychological residuals legacy of slavery, and I'm going to show you a, a bit of that DVD um, looking at those issues. Two, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission. We never had that in this country. I was in South Africa, in Southern Africa, in Botswana, really doing my doctoral research as the white apartheid regime fell and as Nelson Mandela and the Black Party uh, uh, black control party rose to power. And throughout that process, they had what was called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where the whites openly admitted wrongdoing and confessed and asked for forgiveness. And on the other hand, blacks listening to this offered their forgiveness. And I think it was 100 percent. I'm not sure. Some still to this day have harbor some some anger because of what took place since 1948 up until uh, 1998 or 1994. Uh, three, reparations to the slaves' descendants. Over 400 years of unpaid labor to build this country. And those descendants have yet to see a penny 
in reparations, but yet other groups, the Native Americans who had their land ripped, out, ripped away, the Japanese who were placed in internment camps during World War II and lost their properties, all received uh, money from the government. Uh, the survivors of the Jewish Holocaust, not here, but in Europe, began to receive reparations for the losses that they endured almost right in the early 50s up until today. It's still going on with some of the co companies that own uh, businesses and that abuse the use of uh, Holocaust survivor skills, labor, etc. Four, mass incarceration of black men and boys. We hear about the prison industrial complex. We hear about the, uh, the, the, the mass incarceration. Uh, one of the things that I worked on in the school district was uh, this prison or school to prison pipeline where most of the students being suspended or expelled in public schools, especially in middle schools, are black males. Now I've worked in prisons. When I taught at the University of Florida, I also worked at a medium security drug treatment center prison. And again, the majority of the inmates there at the prison were black. A majority of my students at the University of Florida were not black, they were white. And that created a, a, con, a conflict for me personally, and it wasn't until I returned to South Florida and began to work with the school board of Broward County and this issue of suspensions uh, that I saw where the problem began. Uh, we have six-year-olds being arrested for throwing paper across the room. They're black or Hispanic. Um, so that's still a problem. You may have read um, uh, a book called the, um, what was it, I'm blanking out now. Uh, it's about the new Jim Crow. And um, it's looking at the prison industrial complex and the failure of the drug, the war on drugs that really put more minorities, so-called minorities, into the prison system. Uh, five, reconstruction of the black family. Uh, we know that slavery separated, destroyed families, sent a mother to one place, sent the father to another place, sent the children uh, to other, um, other properties, other slave owners. And that destroyed the, the, the context of the nuclear family, although because of the, the, the nature and power of the extended family in the African community, uh, we still were able to, to overcome a lot of the problems that breakup of the nuclear family created. Uh, six, eliminating anti-black stereotypes. Um, we've had a number of people do blackface, uh, going all the way back to Al Josen, uh, up to today, last year, I believe it was, an actress went, put on blackface because she felt that she wanted to look like a character on a new TV series. Um, Ongoing apologies to descendants of slaves. Back in 2007, 2008, uh, we had a number of national apologies to black Americans from the US Congress that apologized for the, the institution of slavery. Uh, the US, the Florida state legislature also issued an apology. The American, Anthropo the American Medical Association issued an apology because for a long time blacks were not allowed to go to medical schools that were predominantly white or all white or to become members of hospital staffs. Um, and I'm a result of, 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 of that reality. In 1956 I was born in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and not in Holy Cross or not in Broward General, but in Provident Hospital, which is on Cistrunk Boulevard in the heart of the Northwest area of Fort Lauderdale. That was built by three black doctors, Dr. Cistrunk, Dr. Mizell, and, and, and Dr. Uh, Cistrunk, Mizell, and I'm blanking out here. This is the doctor who, who delivered me, by the way. <laughs> Uh, Dr. Shirley, who passed away just a few years ago. That hospital was opened from 1930s up until the, the mid-1960s. Dr. Shirley was a black physician who graduated number one in his class from the Boston University School of Medicine, 
at a time when blacks were not going to those institutions. He came to South Florida and, and wanted to serve. Uh, but he was not allowed to serve at Holy Cross or at Broward General. Uh, they set up Provident Hospital and roughly 6,000 to 10,000 African American children were born in that facility. Uh, when the other two institutions and other hospitals opened in the late 60s, early 70s, um, that hospital closed and because now they could practice in those facilities and parents and and others could receive services there. Um, attacks on black organizational unity. Back in the early 19, I want to say 1991, 92, 93, um, a group of black organizations, the NAACP, Urban League, and others wanted to meet uh, to address some of the ongoing issues facing black people in this country. And they invited, they had the audacity to invite uh, Louis Farrakhan from the Nation of Islam. And the Anti-Defamation League of B'nai B'rith, which is the Jewish social civil rights group, uh, balked at the idea of having what they say is a, an anti-Semite addressing issues of black people, who himself is black. Um, so what happened was, because the NAACP was funded by individuals and groups from the ADL and other communities, not black communities, the black leadership backed away and disinvited Louis Farrakhan. Uh, but again, the majority of people in this community, in this country, felt black people felt that Louis Farrakhan, the Nation of Islam, is doing a lot to address the issues of, of unemployment, of violence, and other issues facing the black community. Why not have him and his group join this larger social group? Well, again, the meeting never happened, and there have been, that's just one example of the attacks on groups of black people when they want to come together. Others say n yes or no. Uh, nine, re-inclusion of black males positively in the imagery of the United States at home and abroad. Again, if you look at most magazine articles, advertisements, you rarely see black men. You may see one black woman, and you may see a few Hispanics in this community, but the majority are white. Just, in, just look at any advertisement. And again, there's this systematic exclusion of black males from, um, from our consciousness. Some of you may remember a few years ago, Intel did an ad where they had, uh, and I have a copy of it here, where they had a, a white gentleman standing like this, and on each side of him were about five or six black men bent over as if they were worshiping him. And this was a major Intel ad published in most of the, in, of the te technological magazines around. Eventually that ad was pulled after Intel received complaints that it was racist. Outright racist, but that's the kind of thing that we're still dealing with up until the the end of 2000, uh, 2010. And fourth, a tenth, I'm sorry, increase U.S. foreign aid to nations in Black Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, a lot of our aid, foreign aid, in that part of the world goes to Egypt and Israel. And the question is, well, we have 52 other or 51 other nations on the African continent, Sub-Saharan Africa that need funds for, you name it, education, health, development. Why is it going to areas of the world where the money is being used for destruction? So those are 10 areas. As I said, there may be more, and I'm sure there are more, that I have focused on and I feel are, are areas that we need to have honest conversations about. And for the remaining of the time here, I'm going to show you this uh, psychological residuals of slavery, and that will kind of set the, the tone for any discussion that we have, if we have time for it. <laughs> but uh, at least it will get you thinking about uh, these issues, which I, I don't believe you may have had the opportunity to before.
And I want to remind you that this movie was made in the mid-1990s. Our ethnic, racial, and cultural identities shape so much of who we are in the world. And our ethnic, racial, and cultural identities provide a filter through which we look at the same world around us and see it so very differently. We African Americans are a very diverse group. Share three central defining attitudes. All of us belong to a group that is devalued in society. All of us have at one time or another been targets of racial prejudice and discrimination. And finally, all of us, regardless of our differences, whether class, religious, or geographical, share the legacy of slavery. psychological residuals of slavery. I believe an understanding of the impact of slavery is essential for any therapist or human services professional attempting to work with African Americans. The phenomenon of slavery is an enigma. It is difficult for people of all races to discuss. There are few forms where slavery can be talked about openly without the discussion quickly becoming emotionally charged or volatile. For some of us, slavery evokes feelings of shame. Acknowledging it is tantamount to an humiliating admission of inferiority. After all, what decent, self-respecting people can allow such heinous subjugation to your one up this moment? For others of us, slavery is the impetus for getting a type of feelings of profound anguish and rage. For all of us, Slavery is very much a contemporary ghost that defines and shapes our relationships with white people and with ourselves. For whites, slavery usually evokes feelings of shame and guilt. These feelings are often expressed with denial or anger in the effort to distance themselves from really thinking about slavery or to suppress memories or other reactions associated with it. It is not uncommon for whites to suggest that black people's insistence on discussing, even eulogizing slavery as a crutch, a scapegoat, a way of abdicating responsibility for our current conditions. In the rare instances when an open discussion of slavery occurs, white people often ask, what does slavery have to do with who you are today? You were never a slave. So for all these reasons and more, slavery remains a deeply significant but untold story for all of us. Today, some 130 years after the official end of slavery, it remains a major organizing principle of sociocultural life in our country, separating African American and white people. Despite the numerous attempts to ignore, deny, rewrite, trivialize, and romanticize it, there are too many reminders of slavery for it to simply fade away. Places steeped in the history of slavery remain as sites of abstract interest for tourists. 
while in adjacent communities, descendants of slaves and slave owners, many no more than three generations removed from slavery, still struggle to find a way to live together. I am a fourth generation I ask, uh, what does slavery descendant have to do of a slave. All of my great grandmothers American. and fathers were children of slavery that ended. There are no contemporary experiences of African American people that have not been shaded by the nuances of slavery. When we consider that black people have not been out of slavery as long as our ancestors were in it, the hard, brutal realities of slavery become rather chilling and terrifyingly close to us in time. If you and I permitted ourselves to think openly about slavery, there are some things we might all agree about. Savagely uprooting a people from their homes, stripping them of their culture and language, separating them from their families and treating them with a total disregard for their humanity will leave deep residuals. These won't easily disappear merely because those conditions are declared illegal. The last known lynching in Fort Lauderdale was in 1935. In downtown Fort Lauderdale. The reality is that today the majority of black people still suffer from the emotional and psychological trauma of slavery. Although the physical chains have been removed and the law of the land has seemingly become more humane, the descendants of those whose minds, hearts, and psyches were once enslaved remain enslaved emotionally and psychologically. During the days of slavery, a common strategy that slave owners used to oppress their slaves was silencing. Slaves were systematically stripped of their voices. This was accomplished by forbidding them to use their native languages. Has anyone seen 12 Years a Slave, English. the movie? Slaves were forced to abandon their This is what they're describing. If you haven't seen it, and it will and be an Oscar winner, go see it. And write. Slave owners hope to accomplish two things through these measures. To eradicate all sense of Africanness from the psyches of black people, so that they could be retrained to think of themselves as slaves. And to prevent access to any opportunities that would provide slaves with the power to define their experiences for themselves and challenge the conditions of their oppression. When slaves attempted to resist efforts to have their identities redefined, they were beaten whipped and mutilated. Often this took place in the presence of other slaves who were forced to observe this torture and silence. Through this enforced silent observation, slave owners ruthlessly sought to teach their slaves a lesson about the rules of slavery. Whatever suffering, humiliation, and degradation the owners might choose to mete out, their slaves were required to endure it in silence, compliantly with total deference toward their masters. There is ample evidence today to suggest that we are still entangled in the struggles to define who we are, both individually and collectively. As a people, our search for identity has manifested itself in our ongoing effort to define ourselves. First, we were Negroes. Then we were colored. Afro-American, black, and now African-American. We continue to struggle with our name and who has the power to define us. While exerting the authority to name ourselves as affirming, this process alone cannot alter the profound imbalance that continues to separate us from white people. At the individual level, the struggle for identity is also evident. Increasingly, a growing number of black people are choosing to reject their slave names, replacing them with African and other non-European names. Malcolm X, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Tashaki Sanjay, but a few popular examples. Other identity issues coming out of slavery are more difficult to modify. African Americans still struggle with the complexion complex a direct residual of slavery. Colorism, it's called. White-complexion slaves often receive preferential treatment. 
those with dark complexions were relegated to hard labor and field work. For many of us, these internalized attitudes regarding complexion are a major tension within the race. Another residual of slavery that is related to the complexion complex is self-hatred. Slaves were not only taught that dark skin was bad, they were deliberately and systematically socialized to believe that everything associated with their lives was inferior. Slave children were often ripped away from their mother's breasts during infancy so that she could be free to nurse white infants. Slave women raped, abused, and treated as sexual objects by slave masters, while white women were placed on a pedestal. Today it remains difficult for us to receive positive images of ourselves. For example, our children continue to grow up in a world where the images of their white counterparts are the standard. Rarely do our children see images of themselves in the boxes of toys that we buy, on the boxes of their favorite cereals, or in their favorite films and videos. Unfortunately, the message now is not substantially different from the message during slavery. We are not important. Silence, the hallmark of oppression, is another common residual of slavery. Much like the slaves who were forced to stand by silently and witness the abuse of their friends and families, many of us do not feel empowered to openly express our views regarding racial injustice. Indeed, many African Americans will never feel entirely safe in the midst of white people, fearing punishment or censure. Some of us assume a deferential posture in the presence of white people, opting to suffer in silence as we struggle with rage. Silence is a precursor of rage. Rage is an intense emotion reaction to injustice and degradation. In one sense, it represents the accumulation of anger and humiliation denied expression. As silence and the loss of one's voice, that is the inability to speak and act on one's own behalf, have characterized the African American experience historically, so has rage. Because of our shared legacy of slavery, oppression, and racism, many of us struggle with the management and expression of rage. What many white people often see as the excessive and inexplicable anger of black people is a residual of generations of humiliation and degradation. While I believe that all of us experience rage, there's a variety of ways in which it might be expressed. Just as anger and hurt denied expression eventually transform into rage, rage denied expression eventually transforms into violence. For some of us, rage is expressed through a host of socially supported activities such as writing, performing arts, athletics, and social and political activism. These opportunities are critical because they facilitate the reestablishment and reclaiming of one's own voice. Others of us may fail to find a vehicle for retrieving our voices and may resort to violence. Regardless of how the violence is manifested, rage is a precipitating force that drives it. riots in response to Rodney King verdict represent an excellent illustration of the relationship between oppression, rage, and violence. In 1980, we had the same Many of the incident here in Miami. Numbers of African Americans today for the same reasons are directly tied to rage and ultimately to the legacy of slavery. Duffy. That's <laughs> the Duffy. High blood pressure, heart disease, mental stress, alcoholism, hopelessness, performance anxiety, anger, psychological homelessness, and abbreviated life expectancy, especially due to violence, are some of the indirect ways in which rage is expressed in the midst of oppressive conditions. The legacy of slavery continues to shape the experience of African Americans 
and our relationships with white. If we are to move forward to a more promising future, this aspect of our collective past must be discussed and validated. Are we at a place to even admit that all of our lives, both black and white, have been permanently scarred by the trauma of slavery? Can we, black and white, even imagine a world where our relationship dares to challenge the ways in which slavery has defined it historically? No, I don't think so. Not unless the psychological residuals of slavery can be healed. I hope that in some small way, this videotape will serve as a catalyst for this healing and the beginning of the new dialogue between all of us. For some comments, I'd be interested. Yeah. Have the lights, please. Um, as you see, that's number one of the ten unfinished agenda items for civil rights that I brought to you today. And I'm just curious to know, and I hope that in some other classes or some other sessions that that you all have a chance to discuss this further. And I'd be happy to come back down and, and have conversations about this. Um, but just from what you saw uh, in the video and what you heard from me earlier, are there any thoughts, comments, concerns? Yes, sir. I think one of the things that has to do is being a Hispanic male, we're always faced with choices that we can partake either to take the blue pill or take the red pill. And we take pretty much what's going to be sounding fun right now, but it's going to bring bad consequences that will put us in jail. And that's the path that we're going to take, as we saw in, in some of the examples. But if we take, say, the example of we're here in college, you know, we've gone through a lot of different situations to get here, and we're still here. And like yourself, you know, to be able to have all the experiences that you've accumulated from, from, from your ancestors to now, it's, it's all a matter of choice. It really comes down to what pathway do you want to take. So I think a lot of it has to do with, with the choices that we choose to take and also the way we've been raised. I, I agree. Um, a few years ago, since you mentioned the Hispanic component, um, Harvard professor um, Skip Gates was here in South Florida, primarily at Miami-Dade College. Um, to promote his new series, uh, Black in Latin America, in which he went to documented uh, six countries, Cuba, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Mexico, Peru, and Brazil. And he talked about the, the impact of racism in those countries on the folk who are identified as Negro or Black, and, and how when folk come from those countries to this country, um, they identify with, not with their black roots, they could be as dark as I am, if not darker, they will identify as white when they're given the little Federal Directive 15 categories to choose. And I think back, I have cousins, my great grandmother was born in Honduras, um, and that whole family is there. They are African, blacks, but they don't identify themselves as black. They use the word blanco, blanca, white, to, you know, when you're looking at colors, not negro or negra. Uh, so there is this issue. Even coming to this country, according to the, the uh, last census, of those identified as Hispanic or Latino or Latina, identified, co-identified as white, 97% of them, even though many of them were as black as black can be. So there is this issue, and I say, well, of course, if you're coming to a country, you're coming to look for opportunity. I would identify with the people at the top of the race hierarchy. I certainly wouldn't identify with the people at the bottom. Uh, and so there is that issue, and that's a whole different conversation that Dr. Gates tried to get started in this country uh, a few years ago. So for me, it's important 
to know the history that you're talking about, what my ancestors did, who, the, who were they? I'm now in the process personally of going through the DNA testing to find out exactly which tribes, and the word is tribes because as you saw, when Africans were brought here, they were mixed and exchanged and sold from one plantation to the other. Uh, so you had different groups intermarrying in, in, into one another. So I'm curious to know about that. But luckily, I had a grandfather from the Bahamas. On my father's side, they immigrated from the Bahamas. On my mother's side, she's eighth generation Floridian from North Florida. And both groups intermingled with the Seminoles. There's a large Seminole black population on Andros Island in the Bahamas, the largest island in the Bahamas and the least inhabited. And on my mother's side, both my great-grandmothers are Cherokee Seminole. So I grew up hearing about that part of my history, but my grandfather gave me appreciation for my African roots. That's why when I got the chance through the Peace Corps, I went to Ghana, where most West at most people in this hemisphere came from, that part of Africa. So it's important, and unfortunately in our schools, even though it's a state mandate that black history be taught, not just in February, but throughout the year, um, it's not. Our teachers are not trained to understand the full essence of black history, not just once they got here as slaves, but all of the kingdoms and, and societies that were built on the continent of Africa. So you raised some good points there. Anyone else? Any other? Yes? Um, it's interesting you're talking about genealogy and going back as far as you know. Um, my parents were both born in Cuba, but you could see physically my mother looks more Spaniard because she's got the mix of African and Cuban and Spanish, and my father could uh, clearly, he physically looks more Nigerian, which is where my family um, came from on that side. And I know directly the tribe Yoruba is where most of my bloodline is from. Okay. But you know parents, more than yourself than I know about myself. That's great. My parents, my parents had two of us, me and my little sister, but she physically looks more like my father, and I kind of look a little bit like both of them. Like my face looks like my father's, but my skin tone is a little bit in between. And my last name is a Portuguese last name. And this is one aspect of my history that is hard for me to put my finger on. The name is Portuguese, but the direct bloodline is uh, from the, Yorubu, the Yoruba tribe of Nigeria and from some, you know, ex-conquistadors from Spain, who knows where. And where Portugal. And it's um, funny that my little sister believes that I've gotten more opportunities than she has gotten. Because you're lighter than she is. For example, she goes to Miami Dade and I go here. This is one of the main things and she seems to show a lot of this envy often through hate and I don't know how to explain to her that I still love her. We came from the same blood but because of such a tiny physical difference, we have this serious rift between us and it seems impossible to get over right now. Even though we know we know most of our genealogy we came from the same... Yeah, the same mother and same father? Same mother and same wow. father. Same family history. But the complexions are different. And we, look, we look slightly different. Slightly different. In fact, her nose looks more like my mother's. My mother looks more Spaniard in the face. And my face looks more like my father's, you know? I, uh, I show more African in my face than my sister does. Mm. And I feel like so many people that I've met that come from other countries, they're like, wow, I didn't even realize black and white until I came to America. <laughs> and um, I, I, I did a study abroad in uh, China, 
Oh. And I felt I felt like I felt like my skin and my hair had 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 more to do with my popularity than anything else because I, I didn't I didn't feel the impact of Af you're African or you're Hispanic or whatever it, and I don't know this this classification of people seems to be very predominant in America and in South Africa I see it very much outside, outside of these regions oh, all right I have go ahead <laughs> <laughs> well, I have, I did a presentation um, on this very issue and on, on, I mentioned Federal Directive 15, which is what the U.S. government has created to identify all of us, uh, primarily in the workforce, but in schools and in other, um, other environments. And they have uh, white, and those are people of European, Western, Eastern European descent and southern European descent, black people of sub-Saharan Africa now. Um, so from, from below uh, Morocco, Mauritania, Algeria, Libya, below, they consider, the U.S. government considers those people black. Above the Sahara, from, from Egypt all the way across to Morocco, um, those are, are considered white. They're lumped in with the Western Europeans. Uh, so Saddam Hussein and Muammar Gaddafi were, were white, even though they were uh, perceived to be terrorists, Muslims. Um, and then there's Asian, so those from China south, and then South Pacific Islanders, and Native Americans. So those are the categories. And then Hispanics are not a race, but an ethnicity. But in, two years ago, in the school district here, and I presume in other professional environments, individuals who identified themselves as Hispanic were in one foul swoop in Broward County now, and I know the gentleman in the computer department who did this, he moved all of those students who were identified as Hispanic, irrespective of the, the skin tone, into the white category. So all of a sudden, over one year, Broward went from a predominantly black student population in the school district to a predominantly white. And then it was up to parents to decide to, to change their racial category as, if they so choose. But that just basically followed what had been going on with the, with the census. As I mentioned earlier, when Latinos come to this country, According to the census, they identify 95, 96% white, even though they may be blacker than I am. Um, and again, they identify with the power structure. You don't want to identify and be a part of a group that's at the bottom of the social structure, which blacks are in this society and throughout Latin America, by the way. Any other? I'm, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and at this time, I'm going to formally close proceedings, okay. but informally we'll be able to continue. I just want to get a chance for those of us who are able to stay to just say thank you oh. for coming. Yeah.